Good day, Africa, and welcome to the first episode of AgroLinks. And AgroLinks is brought to you by the Association of African Universities Headquarters here in Accra, Ghana. And today being the first episode of AgroLinks, we are privileged to be hosted by the Executive Director of FARA. And FARA is the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. And we will be discussing the role of agricultural research in Africa, um, um, the, the role of FARA in agricultural research in Africa. And we are so much privileged to have Dr. Yemi Akimbamijo, and he is Executive Director, who will be taking us through the role of FARA in agricultural research and development in Africa. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. How are you doing, Prof? Pretty, pretty well, and it's a great pleasure to be able to um, be your guest at the very first maiden edition of um, AgroLink. FARA is privileged, and we are very, very delighted to be able to share our perspectives um, to the audience on um, AU, AU TV. Work as well. Yeah. Okay. So we are also much privileged to, to be with you this morning to look at some key issues concerning agricultural research and development in Africa. But in the very first place, we want to find out what has been the role of FARA in advancing agricultural research and innovation in Africa. Well, thank you very much. Um, FARA became a child of necessity um, in the year 1997 when some of the elders of the day thought that there is a compelling need for a cohesive action towards governizing the nations on the continent to have a coherent move towards advancing agriculture on the continent. And um, so FARA was, was set up initially in the World Bank offices in Washington, D.C. Okay. And um, it came up at that time under the name SPAR, S-P-A-A-R, <clears throat> which is the Special Program for African Agricultural Research. Um, but it was then managed from the World Bank as a program of the World Bank in 1997. So in essence, FARA started being a child of necessity, as I called it, because there was just no convening institution that can be the port parole for the continent when it comes to agricultural research and how to advance the course of agriculture. So that was the raison d'etre, how FARA evolved. But then it um, ultimately shifted to Africa. I will refer to that relocation um, with time. Okay. So for how long have you been operating on the continent? <clears throat> Okay, basically, um, it was in 2002 that um, FARA ultimately took residence in Africa, building from the reasoning that it doesn't really make sense for an African agricultural research program um, to be domiciled in Washington. Washington. Okay. So it was at a meeting in Ouagadougou where the um, FAO office regional office for Africa was requested to host um, SPA, which has just then been renamed FARA, which is the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. And the likes of Adrian Mukibi, Kanayong Wanze, um, Mokta Toure, um, these are the big names. Um, Mrema, Godfrey Mrema, and a few names around the continent, Florence Wambugu, who were the first thinkers that actually thought, yes, <clears throat> we need to be, bring this institution back to the continent okay. and set it up as a full-fledged Pan-African institution. And it was hosted by the African, I mean, FAO office in Accra. So it was more or less um, a protege of the FAO. And, and by virtue of Africa, FAO being domiciled in Accra, FARA automatically came to Ghana. Okay, that's yeah. amazing. Then um, it means that practically FARA has been in existence in, on the continent for 16 good years. So what would be your assessment of, or uh, what, what would be the state of agriculture in Africa, if I, I could ask you? Um, that's a million dollar question to start with, but I must also give um, a lot of credit to my predecessor, um, Monty Jones and all the other men and women who paid their dues to ensure the advancement of agriculture on the continent is where it is today. Um, like um, it's it being said, um, 
in, in philosophical, philosophically speaking, that if I have not climbed on the shoulders of the giants, I would not have seen further. So um, I give the tribute to all those who came before me and um, paved the way for a credible agricultural institution, which was actually put together by the people I named earlier on. But also, I must give the credit to the sub-regional organizations, especially to Asareka and um, Koraf, who are the first sponsors of FARA. And um, since the inception and um, the opening of or commencement of operations of FARA in 2002, you may recall that <laughs> historically, that was the year before Maputo. So FARA kind of, um, FARA came before Maputo just one year before. And um, it was not planned, but that was just, that's the history. And um, FARA came in, and not too long after that, FARA became the pillar institution responsible for agricultural technologies and dissemination of technologies under the CADEP initiative. So if FARA wasn't there, CADEP Pillar 4 would have had a big issue. And um, credit must be given to all those who helped to advance CADEP Pillar 4. In my own judgment, I would see that as probably the most successful of the erstwhile pillars of, um, of CADEP. You may recall there were four pillars on um, land and water management, on food security, on technologies and markets. And of all of these, I think there was none that had the kind of impact that Farah had, which means that Farah therefore came in at the right time and um, gave a soft landing for, for, for CADEP to be able to actually pave the way for the role of science in agriculture. And I will speak to that a little bit when it comes to the origin of the science agenda and, and, and what, Farah, what role Farah played um, in the outdooring of the science agenda within the bigger picture. Yeah. Okay. Then um, we want to know, you know Farah is has been purposefully instituted to advance agricultural research, which we know research is very important mm -hmm. in every aspect of, of our continent. I know we may have heard of the developmental agenda on the continent, such as the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, mm -hmm. and also the African Development Bank. Um, one of the high five strategies is to make sure that we are able to feed Africa. Mm -hmm. How does FARA come in in all these mm -hmm. developmental agenda on the continent? Um, well, first and foremost, um, we, we should defragment the issues one after the other. Um, when you look at the, the, the high five of the African Development Bank and the Feed Africa initiative within the context of the high five, it's actually drawing on the comparative advantage of Africa. Now, Africa is one of those continents whose economies is agrarian, and of necessity contributes to the GDP of, that, of, the, of the continent. We contribute anything between 25 and 30 and 40 percent of GDP coming from agriculture. So it therefore makes sense that you concentrate on how to enhance that sector. In other words, you need to support the goose that lays your golden egg. When you look at the policy frameworks that are on the continent, uh, you, you've got st the STISA, yeah. which is the Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa. You've got the CADEP. You've got the um, Agenda 2063. You've got the 3AGT, which is the Acceleration, acceleration for Agricultural Advancement and Growth uh, Transformation. You've got the, um, the Agenda 2063, which is the Africa we want, and all of this. Now, all of these frameworks actually seek one common goal, and that is summarized in the Africa we want, which is the Agenda 2063. But Agenda 2063 will become a mirage <coughs> if agriculture bottoms out. Exactly. 
So that is the crux of the matter. Agenda 2063 will fall apart if agriculture doesn't hold water. So that tells you how important agriculture is. Now, if agriculture is that important to Agenda 2063, Stiza 2024 will not hold, and the um, Malabo Declaration for 2025 will also not hold. So, I mean, these are strategic political frameworks that do not only contribute to the bigger goal of the SDGs, but for the good of the continent and for the realization of the Agenda 2063, you need to look into agriculture. Now, looking into agriculture, what does that mean? And that's where the rubber meets the road. It means investing in agriculture in a coherent, consistent manner. TAT has come in at a time like this. I actually give a different meaning to TAT. TAT is Technologies uh, Transformation of African Agricultural Technologies, but I call it taking all actions together. Because definitely, unless we all have an all-round approach to the development of agriculture, we will not move. And as it is always said, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So we've got to understand that we have to have an approach that is all-inclusive, an approach that is all-embracing, an approach that is, that is, I would call it a synoptic approach that engages all hands on deck at the same time. Granted that agricultural development on the continent is at different levels in different countries, but in the history of agricultural development on this continent, nothing comes closer to the advancement that has been made because of CADEP. And CADEP is what it is, largely also because of Pillar 4. And Pillar 4 is honed on the essence of FARA. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time to explain all of this so you see where FARA and agricultural technology stands in the bigger picture. I always say it, I mean, to double productivity, as Malabo says, is the easiest of our problems. And that's not the goal. That's a means to an end. So make no mistakes about it. To double the productivity is a biological process. And that can happen like this. Late President Mutharika did it in, 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 Malabo, in uh, Malawi. So it's been, it's doable, it's been done, it's been proven. But the big question is the improvement of livelihoods. That's the end. So I always say that it's not just a question of doubling productivity. If you double productivity and livelihood is not improved, you've got double mess. It's a doubled mess in your hands. If you have double milk yield and you cannot sell it, you've got double mess in your hands. If you have a double yield of cassava or potato or tomato, call, call it whatever. Unless you are able to transform that into improvement of livelihoods, then we have not made a mark. And that's why Agenda 2063, I like the, outgo the, 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 the ultimate goal, is to have an Africa that is food secure and a prosperous Africa. So the prosperity there is the key word, which is based Actually, if you look at prosperity in Africa, you must look at agriculture. Because the next wave of prosperity will spin out of agriculture. And it will only spin out of agriculture if you apply science that gives you both the mechanical and the biological advantages in agriculture. Okay. So Prof, looking, um, doc, looking at the, the, the space, agriculture space at every country level, mm -hmm. we you know Africa, we are blessed with human resources. Mm -hmm. We are also blessed with natural resources as well. But how do we ensure that we're able to harness these two key resources that we have to promote agriculture on the continent? And how do we start from the country level and then at the continental level, everything comes together beautifully to achieve the agendas that we have on the continent? I think we have not given 
the due um, regard to agriculture as we should. Um, Dr. Kanye on Wednesday, the, the erstwhile president of IFAD, um, made a very uh, strong statement when he was in office as IFAD president that Africa's agriculture is too important to be outsourced. And that's what we've done all our lives. We've outsourced Africa's agriculture. The funding comes from outside Africa. Expertise, expertise training, everything, we look for donors. Until we recognize the need for us to have homegrown attitude that will be focused and directed at strengthening our capacities in-house, in-continent, that is the only way for us to make a headway. So uh, I believe that um, we need to build our capacities. We need to strengthen our infrastructures. If you look at the continent today, take out the Northern African countries and take out South Africa, you probably can count on your fingertips how many countries or how many HPLC facilities, how many facilities for um, molecular biology you have on in West Africa or in East Africa. So our capacity to deploy science is still very, very weak. Now, if that is our starting point, then we've got to come back to the drawing board and say to ourselves, do we have the institutional capacities? Do we have the educational, the, the, the mental capacity? What do you think we have? Do we have the institutional capacity and also the, the, the structures as well? Do we have it as a continent? Um, there is room for improvement. Okay. Um, we've moved a long, a long way. I remember making a statement somewhere um, saying that we have a huge science deficit mm. in our agricultural system. And um, a honorable minister of, of a particular country um, contested that with me. Fine. But what I am saying today, we will not move too far with what we call the feed them, weigh them, kind of science. When people are splitting mitochondria, when people are, are, are doing nanotechnologies, feed them, weigh them is no longer the option. Proximate analysis is not enough. You've got to learn the science within the science. So if you look at the way those, when you tell people that Africa's food bill is 35 billion, that's what we take to the market to buy food for Africa. Those getting those, yes, those getting those 35 billion, how do they produce their own food that they are selling to us? With hoes and cutlasses? Definitely not. I was in a particular situation in a particular country, and all I could say is you are not running a farm here. You are running a factory if you look at how they are producing tomato without soil. If you look at how they are producing in some situations in, in, in Asia, without soil, without water, just air, aeroponics, hydroponics, and we are still struggling under the sun with hose and cutlasses. No, the degree of the deployment of science in Africa does not match the degree of the food need in Africa. So it's, as I gave it as an example two days ago, it is like competing on a bike with a jet. No, you are just not on the same, on the same trajectory. No, we, we've not started. So judge for yourself. If um, we, 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 we are well on track, but what we're saying is that because Rome was not built in a day, and I'm not saying we should make that leap, but wherever, unless we have a coherent plan, to say we are going from plan A to from point A to point B, and this is how we're going to get there, this is what it will cost us. We don't seem to have that strategy as at yet, as at now. We are shifting the goalposts. In 2000, we all set the MDGs for 2015 to have poverty. Sure. <laughs> 2015 is now three years behind us. 
we can judge for ourselves whether we have poverty or poverty halved us. So now we then shifted again in 2015 to 20, uh, 2025 SDG. And in between, we have also shifted to 2063. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> let's see how it goes. But we must have, a, it's good to set those benchmarks, but we must have a coherent plan, an action plan that takes us to where we're going. So, Doc, what would you suggest at the national level, what must be done? We know every country on the continent has a ministry dedicated to agri agriculture mm -hmm. and food and what have you. What must be done to ensure that all these various segments of agriculture are put together to advance what we want to achieve on the continent? Well, the first thing I would say is that we are not short of policies anymore. We, we, we have all policies there, there on the shelf. Uh, billions of them. So, um, there is just one soft issue. I use the word soft on purpose. It's not a hard issue because we have the expertise actually we have the youngest uh, youth population. We've got, we've got the best um, land resources. We have 65% of arable land on the continent. We've got 80% of fresh water on the of the planet in the continent. So what is it that is stopping us from actually applying and pronouncing ourselves? That's a soft issue. It's not a hard issue. It's a soft issue of our mentality, putting our acts together, because it's like you give a lady a basket, or give a man, um, whatever, yeah, to cook your kinky and fried fish. You put everything there. Depending on who the cook is, it can turn out good or bad. So by the same token, we've got everything in our basket. Who's cooking? What are our leaders cooking? Or what are we advising our leaders to cook? So what we are churning out or is still not meeting what we are expecting. So that's a soft issue. It's about our mentality. It's about the philosophy to work, to development, to economics, to um, social issues. It, th these are soft issues of, of, of um, ethical orientation, of loyalty to, to, to ourselves and, and so on. So these are, these, are, these are things we need to if we say to ourselves, we want to um, achieve so and so. For instance, in this country, there is a lot of um, goodwill from the point of the government saying that we want to have this, want to improve um, job for the youth in every village, a dam, I mean, one district, one dam, and all of those things, they are good in themselves. And that's, you need to make this advancement one country, or even one district at a time, and one country at a time, one continent at a time. But do you think we, we have a high school deficit in terms of agriculture on the continent? And what role must our universities play? Because you rightly made what mention... What do you mean by high school deficit? Um, we having um, our universities coming up with high degrees of or hu training human resources in agriculture, um, using the technology that is available, mm -hmm. using the best practices across the, the globe, so that at least we'll be able to contribute better or meaningfully to the, the sector as well. Yeah, um, as, as I said before, we've got everything all it takes in, in the con on the continent. Um, and every country on the continent, in my, by my estimation, is very well endowed to be able to express itself agriculturally. If there is no country that cannot exceed, I mean, excel in one commodity or the other. And when you look at countries around the equator, my goodness, they are, they are bursting at the seams. This could, these countries in themselves could feed the continent. But, I mean, I will not name countries. But you look, take mangoes, for example. You get into some countries, it becomes extremely impossible to sell one fruit because the fruits are just dropping, 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 dropping everywhere. So it doesn't make sense to sell anything. But three months after, there is not a single fruit. Yet... You go to Europe, you go to America, you go to the Latin, Latin Americas, there is, no, there is no day you will not find mango juice in Tesco supermarkets. So the, the issue is actually harnessing our resources and rearranging our house. Everything is doable, everything is possible if the goodwill is deployed and the financial resources that would match the will is also deployed. 
So, Doc, is it because of the fact that we are not investing so much in agriculture in terms of research? That is why we've been able to come up with some of these interventions to have um, all-year crop yield for, for the entire continent. For example, we, we import a lot of fruit and vegetables that we have the right soil in Africa to, to just um, grow them. Is it because we are not investing in research? Well, not exactly. In my opinion, I mean, this is, this is a question that is um, neither here nor there. Um, don't forget that on the continent we have um, close to 1 billion people. Uh, put that next to India is 1.3 billion. Exactly. India is making good progress, but India is just one country. There are 54 or 55 count countries in Africa. So it's, it's easier to govern one single country from the center than to govern 55 sovereign states. So when you say, okay, everybody, let's put money in this direction, and the priorities of the sovereign states take, take the kicking. And so having a cohesive action becomes an issue. Take, for example, I mean, there was just this meeting in Kigali earlier on in the year when the member states came together to say, okay, let's have um, duty-free processing zones and so on. Uh, not everybody is signing for their own good reasons. So someday they will come to the table and say, okay, we are ready. But until that happens, we still have our walls. Whereas the biology in agriculture does not respect those artificial walls of our individual sovereignties. So if a pest breaks out like the fall army one breaks out in Ghana, he doesn't need a visa to enter Lome, to enter, to enter Togo. Meanwhile, um, we have to develop transboundary responses, but we have so much um, fragment, fragmentization of our economies and of our agriculture that does not allow for deployment of transboundary issues. So we, we are still caught in between in our own web. The same goes for China. I mean, China has managed to tame hunger, poverty, extreme, um, extreme poverty and malnutrition in a space of 30 years. Brazil did it in a space of 50 years. India did it in a special space of 50 years. Why is Africa still celebrating mediocrity when it comes to food security? Why are we still the destination of food aid after 50 years of independence? What kind of a child is that? In 50 years, you are still taking food in bottle. No way. <laughs> so that is the way to look at it. And to be able to break this ugly scenario, it doesn't come by default. Actually, the default is to keep us in that, in that state of, of, of penury. In a country where we've got wealth, I mean, it does not make sense that we remain, um, we remain bound in poverty, we remain bound in unemployment, when we have the, 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 the possibility to spin wealth out of our own natural endowments. So how do we deal with this? Then, um, Doc, another crucial thing is that wherever you go on the continent, every country um, seems to parade itself for the fact that we have a lot of young people. And in advancing agriculture, we need to get these young people into the sector. But the situation has still been the same. Young people across the continent are not so much enthused about going into, into agriculture, specifically maybe farming or animal husbandry. In your own assertion, how do you think um, FARA could help or the other bigger players on the continent of agriculture could help motivate young people to venture agriculture on the continent? Well, I think um, the youth of today, um, you have to take a holistic appreciation of the life they are living in, the world of today. And um, the options that are before the youths and you have to put it in context. I mean, what can you do without ICT? What can you do without Instagram, without um, WhatsApp, all without media. all the social media tools? And the moment you still see agriculture as the, the responsibility or the descriptor of the poorest of the poorest, mm -hmm. it cannot be attractive to the young people. Exactly. Uh, when they can go into ICT, they can go into property, they can go into many other fields that are very, very lucrative. But the, the, my, 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 um, the way I put it is this. On this continent today, there will be 3 billion meals served. 
That is how much the potential there is in agriculture. Three billion. So those three billion mills are either coming from Africa or they come from overseas. So whichever way, there is a potential. But we need to work out how that potential transforms into jobs and livelihoods for the youth. So um, agriculture has to evolve. It has to go beyond hoes and cutlasses. I will not put my child um, on a farm with hoes and cutlasses after studying in a university to get a degree or got a master's degree in agriculture and then give him a hoe and a cutlass. No, no, nobody will do that. We must not kid ourselves. And let's face it, those selling to us and getting our $35 billion um, dollar bill, they don't use hose and cutlasses. So if they don't use hose and cutlasses, and their youth are in agriculture, why shouldn't we stop using hose and cutlasses, raise the bar, deploy science as it should be, get ICT into agriculture, and tell me when, if the youth are not going to go there. Well, Prof, how, how do we get that done over the space of time? Because we've known that ICT plays a key role in the development of agriculture. But how do we get that investment into some of these high-profile um, ICT tools and technology into the sector? Well, it's all a matter of leadership. Um, I am Nigerian. And at a time um, when I was much younger, I have seen the president of my country, the head of state, launching what was at that time called Operation Feed the Nation. And I've seen him actually demonstrating this on his own farm. And at that time, people could get onto the bandwagon and join him in, in farming. So it's, it's, it's actually what the leadership, I mean, the wind bends as the wind blows. So it's a function of leadership and what, what policies there are to entice the youths or to really um, entice people to go into farming. I will not go into farming if I'm not sure that the policy that is favoring farming today will not be there tomorrow. Because then you are going to be caught high and dry. Mm -hmm. And then you are on your own. But if you are assured that, yes, this policy is in place, is here to stay, and there is no policy somersault, as we call it, then you will be encouraged to put your investment, and investors will have the, the trust. And unfortunately, I mean, if the trust is once violated, investors know better. They will not come back. So um, leadership needs to do a lot in ensuring that the trust is not violated, and the confidence reposed in the leadership is not violated. Okay. And another key thing is that, you know, research plays a very vital role mm -hmm. in, in, in agriculture. And we have a lot of research output on the continent by a renowned agriculturalist on the, on the continent. But the problem has still been translating the knowledge or translating the research output into commercialization where uh, rural farmers would have access to the new technologies, the knowledge that is coming up. What do you think must be done to ensure that we are able to translate the research output into tangible use for our farmers? Yeah, I mean, it's all around the question of demand-driven research. Um, if you, I once went to a university in the United States, and I hope the same is also true for most land-grant universities, I went to the state, it's actually Ohio State University, and there I am told that in every county in Ohio State, there is somebody from Ohio State University, Faculty of Agriculture, Department of Extension in the county, responsible and in touch with the farmers. The same is true in South Africa. So agricultural research does not evolve in vacuo. It doesn't evolve on its own. Agricultural research evolves from the on-the-spot, in-situ scenarios that drive research questions. I mean, how it is then that people have problem, you are developing the solution, it does, it's automatic aspiration of the solutions, if the solutions matches their problems. But how do we do it? You have a faculty of agriculture here in Legon, and 
somebody is in Kumasi or somebody is in, is in, is in Tamale or in Aflao, and he doesn't even know where Legon is. And yet, people are publishing research, publishing research and becoming professors and so on. And that's good. I mean, I, I give a lot of respect to, 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 to Legon. Uh, yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a ph phenomenal institution. But this is how we have all evolved in the, on the continent, that our research institutions did not have a, the, 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 the answers we are answering in research stations do not always originate from a question on the farm. So when the answers are generated, we are looking for questions. Whereas questions are generated and they are looking for answers. So we've got this mismatch. That is still That's right. So um, right or wrong on my own part, I'm not, um, <laughs> I'm not a panacea of agriculture, but I think that um, the demand-driven situation is still our best, best scenario. And we have not mastered that properly. And that is why Dr. Akimumi Adishino of the African Development Bank came up with the issues around deployment of um, on-the-shelf technologies because these technologies were generated and they are just hanging on the shelf. Now, we have to look into the kitty and say, okay, what do we have? What is now good? We have to now kind of mix and match and then try to scale out. Because it's not all technologies on the shelf that is also needed on the ground. And it's not all the problems on the ground that have a um, solution on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So we have to mix and match, look into the shelf and look onto the farm and see what is corresponding. And then new issues will, will emerge and we'll try to find solutions from the bench. Okay. So Doc, um, in terms of FARA, what are some of the interventions that you do for, for these challenges that we have on the continent? In terms of research, um, what are the research interventions you come up with? In terms of teaching and knowledge sharing and translation as well, yeah. what are some of the interventions that FARA well, brings up? Well, FARA's flagship at the moment is what we call the Science Agenda for Agriculture in Africa. Now, the Science Agenda for Agriculture in Africa came out of what is called the Dublin Process mm -hmm. in 2010. Um, this was something that came out of the consultations sponsored by Irish Aid and a few um, cohort of donors meeting in Dublin and ultimately came out with a four-point agenda. One of these four-point agenda was to set up um, a science agenda for agriculture in Africa, which was ceded to FARA to lead. And one of them, was the, the issues was also to sign an MOU between the CG centers and the Commission, uh, the African Union Commission. And then there were two other elements coming out of the, the Dublin process. But what concerns FARA the most is the leadership of the Science Agenda for Agriculture in Africa, which was outdoored in 2014. And um, unfortunately, even though we have this policy, we have this document outdoored since 2014, having the financial muscle to roll this out has also been a challenge. So, but recently, thanks to IFAD, who actually um, spearheaded the, the great work, we have now been able to um, operationalize the science agenda in um, all the five tier one countries and we are now moving on with countries that are now putting active demand on FARA to mainstream science agenda like um, Togo, Benin, Malawi, South Africa, um, Egypt, Senegal, Ghana, um, Rwanda. So we have a few countries who are now doing what we thought should be the panacea, the right thing to do, to ensure that we um, mainstream science in the way we do agriculture. As I always put it, I mean, you don't need rocket science in agriculture, but not to do science in agriculture is no longer an option. Because come to think of it, everything in agriculture, be it crop feed, be it livestock, is based on biology, form three biology. The, study of life. So you cannot, therefore, deal with, uh, with agriculture, deal with farming without science. But that said, the role of science stops at the farm gate. Now, after the farm gate, a different process kicks in altogether. So this is now driven by socioeconomic factors, the market issues, the societal issues, the demand and supply issues, 
in the bigger scale, scheme of things, issues around infrastructure, issues, issues around um, jobs, issues around wealth creation, issues around infrastructure, roads, and, and so on. So these are the value chain. These are the things that then kick off um, post-production, which is no longer biology. But post-production will not happen if the pre-production is not solid and robust enough. Yeah. So, Doc, how does the ordinary farmer mm -hmm. um, get the intervention of, of FARA? Do you have sub um, groups, agencies that you work with who are able to translate everything that you do at the continental level to the grassroots farmer? Um, no, we, we try to. Uh, FARA is the apex body and we are actually underpinned by our sub-regional organizations and we try to influence the national um, the, the national in um, what is it and the, the national investments uh, yeah something in agriculture uh, it just it just escaped me now but there is a national investment um, body and documents in every country and we try to influence that and by influencing that what we try to do is to ensure that governments try to do things in a way that is science responsive, gender responsive, in a way that investments are applied to things that we think will kind of leapfrog the agricultural sector in every country. Therefore, governizing growth. Yeah. Okay. So then finally, before we, we, we let you go, mm -hmm. what do you make of the future of agriculture on the continent, taking into consideration the fact that now every country is um, kind of in a way developing infrastructure, putting up buildings here and there. We are still competing with the, the, the farming space or farming land. What do you think the future of Africa um, is in terms of agriculture? I think it doesn't get better than it is now. Um, sensitization of the youth has been at, at an all-time high because agricultural development is going to be linked, inextricably linked, to the impact that youth will make in agriculture. It's not the 60, 70-year-old grandparents that will make the impact we are looking for. So this is an exciting period for us in Africa. As I said, we've got three billion meals served per day on the continent. So that is the scope, the magnitude of the opportunities, the opportunities that we have on the continent. So um, this is also the, the, the kind of um, opportunities that exist for the youth, opportunities that exist for investors, because there is an obligate demand on every person to eat three times a day. Now, I either eat something that is grown here in Accra or grown in West Africa or grown <laughs> outside Africa. But to eat is a must. Now, what you eat is the question and what then is the role of the local markets, the local producers in ensuring that they have a part on what is on my plate. Because if you look at the plate, we put a plate on your, on your table today Look at that plate this afternoon. Look at your, your jollof rice. That rice is coming from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. the, tomato is the tomato is coming from Italy China or France. No, it's coming from Italy and France. Mm -hmm. Okay, the pepper is probably okay from Abelengpe or somewhere in the, <laughs> in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Abelengpe is a place I love very much. Okay. But, I mean, just look at every plate you eat and analyze it. In the morning you had bread. That wheat is coming from where? From Russia. You had bread, you had milk. You added the milk, that milk is coming from a country in Europe. You added sugar, that sugar is coming from outside Ghana. And then you walk up in your office and say, yes, I'm food secure. How secure is that? So that is the question we should be asking ourselves. Look at the plates before you at every meal and ask yourself, what is the carbon footprint behind everything, every spoon you scoop? What's the carbon footprint? How many kilometers has that spoon traveled before it reaches your mouth? But nobody looks at those. 
<sighs> Every good conversation they say never ends, but yeah. that is um, has been so much amazing having you and we have been discussing the, the role of FARA in terms of agricultural development in Africa. Yeah. Thank you so much, though. And we it's know your door will always be open to us when yeah, you come back. Certainly, Thank certainly, you so much. Certainly. Viewers, this has been the first episode of AgroLink, and AgroLink is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. My name is Chrissy Sam, and thanks for watching. See you next time.